All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the March 8th meeting of the Jefferson County Board of Education. Before the board meeting, uh, starting at 4 o'clock, as is the normal start time for this board, um, we had two work sessions. Uh, the first one was a report from the Magnet <coughs> Schools um, Committee, uh, kind of an update on their work. And uh, I think I speak for my colleagues on the board when I say it was really inspiring to see the level of uh, time commitment and energy that um, community members, parents, um, our teachers, and our administrators were giving to that really important work. The second work session was uh, a review of turnaround strategies that are working and not working so well in our middle schools. Um, it was really uh, partly an information um, exchange where the board learned from what we've done and partly a, um, a brainstorming session really on ideas that are coming into consideration for some of the schools that still need um, to improve quite a bit. Um, no action was taken in either case, but um, it's kind of interesting at this point in the um, the board's work cycle where we've agreed on a strategy and we've uh, delegated it to Dr. Hargens and her team. I think a lot of the actual work of the board is going on in these work sessions beginning at 4 p.m. Um, so pay attention to that, those of you who are um, interested in seeing sort of where the real, um, the real activity is going on. Um, before we um, go into our moment of silence, which is where we usually start our meetings, I want to just um, remember uh, Jay McGowan, the president of Bellarmine University, and ask that we uh, honor him in our moment of silence. Um, last week, Louisville lost one of its leading moral voices for the transformative power of education when Jay passed away unexpectedly, um, and he leaves a very big hole in um, so many of our lives and hearts, but also our work. Uh, President McGowan came to Louisville in 1990, bringing big hopes and ambition to what uh, some of us are old enough to remember was a very, very modest, even nondescript commuter college um, in Louisville. Over his 26 years in Louisville, he put Bellarmine way, well on the way to achieving what they also call their Vision 2020, which he described as sometimes, uh, he sometimes called it becoming the Notre Dame of the South. And um, again, those of you who remember what Bellarmine used to be know that um, there was huge transformation. He was instrumental in the formation of Louisville's 55,000 degrees as a partnership of higher ed, K-12, public education, <coughs> business, and community leaders, all focused on using education as the key to our common goals of an, a prosperous citizenry and uh, a larger life for the community. Closer to our home here, um, Jay and Dr. Hargens together sponsored the JCPS Bellarmine Literacy Pro Project, which only two weeks ago this board heard an absolutely wonderful report um, on the work that they're doing with 39 of our highest need elementary schools. Um, <coughs> Dr. Hargens and I both attended President McGowan's funeral yesterday and one of his friends remembered what made him special as an educator, and I'll quote here, he always remembered that each student was an individual with a first and last name who had entrusted their thoughts and mind to him. He was also a good friend. Um, so as we take our customary moment of silence, maybe we reflect on President McGowan's example and strive to bring the same respect to our students and to each other. Our moment of silence. Okay, thank you all very much. We move next to the reading of the vision statement. And I am sorry to say, wait a minute, who's reading the vision statement? It would be me. Okay, me? Me. Me, me. okay, Diane, <laughs> go ahead, take it away. All Jefferson County public school students graduate prepared, empowered, and inspired to reach their full potential and contribute as thoughtful, responsible citizens of our diverse, shared world. Thank you. Okay, let's now please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance.
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Now I would like to introduce Ms. Terry Robinson to lead us through our recognitions and resolutions. Thank you, Dr. Hargens, Board Chair David Jones, Jr., and members of the Jefferson County Board of Education. We begin this evening with the recognition of Dimitri Miners, a student in the Aaron's Work Transition Program, as a 2016 Yes I Can Award recipient. The award recognizes students with disabilities who have excelled in, in the, any of the following areas, which is academics, arts, athletics, school and community service, transition, self-advocacy, and technology. He is one of three Kentucky students who will travel to the National Conference in St. Louis in April to be recognized and presented with the National Yes I Can Award. Board Vice Chair Diane Porter and Assistant Superintendent Dr. Alicia Everett, please come forward and congratulate Dimitri. Joining in the recognition is his teachers, Autumn Garrity and Brandon Skipworth, Coordinator of ECE Programs, Angelique Shearer, and Administrator Jackie June. His parents are with him tonight. I'd like to ask his parents to stand to be recognized. Next, we have the honor of recognizing Elena Sapienza Wright, a student at DuPont Manual High School, for winning the 2015 Kentucky High School Athletic <coughs> Association Class Three State Cross Country Championship. She is also a stellar student who currently holds a 4.17 grade point average. She is an accomplished pianist and is part of the Youth Performing Arts Piano Magnet is a member of her school beta club and volunteers with local charities. Board Vice Chair Diane Porter and Area 2 Assistant Superintendent Amy Dennis, please come forward to extend congratulations to Elena. Joining in the recognition is her coach Tim, Tim Holman and Principal Jerry Mays. Her family is also here with her tonight. Would you please stand and be recognized? It is a privilege and honor to recognize the Jefferson County Public School District schools that received Energy Star certification from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Auburndale Elementary, Bowen Elementary, Coral Ridge Elementary, Lane Elementary are now six of 34 district schools that have received the distinguished designation. The designation recognizes these schools as national models and leaders in improving and protecting the environment and in promoting energy efficiency. Board member Stephanie Horn and Area 6 Assistant Superintendent Joe Leffert, please congratulate Lisa Wathen, principal of Bowen Elementary School. Board member Chuck Hadaway and Area 3 Assistant Superintendent Dr. Paige Hartstern, please congratulate Ron Marshall, Principal of Lane Elementary School. <laughs> Board
board member Linda Duncan and Area 2 Assistant Superintendent Amy Dennis, Blake Bob James, Principal of Coral Ridge, and Zachary Eccles, Principal of Minor Lane Elementary School. Board member Dr. Lisa Wilner and Area 4 Assistant Superintendent Michelle Dillard, please come forward to extend congratulations to Michelle Kiggins, Principal of Rangeland Elementary School. Dr. Hargens and members of the Jefferson County Board of Education, this concludes our recognitions for this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Robinson. Um, it is now time to vote to receive the recognitions. Is there a motion? Mr. Brady moves. Okay, Ms. Duncan seconds. All in favor, aye. Those passed unanimously. So um, congratulations to the recipients, to their parents, to their entire schools. Um, it is our custom at this point in the meeting to invite anyone who has homework to either do or grade or supervise to feel free to stand up and depart if they would like to. Um, otherwise, you are totally welcome to stay and listen to more of our meeting, which tonight includes presentation by the mayor, so we have a special treat, but you may nonetheless want to take off. So, all right, we'll take just about a minute while people um, walk out. <laughs> okay, great. Um, we are, for the first time tonight, implementing our amended um, meeting agenda. So the next item is the approval of the meeting agenda. Before we do that, I want to add one other improvement that Mr. Brady has suggested for a long time, which is that I state ahead of time whether we're going to have an executive session. The answer is yes at the end of the meeting. Um, so we will be a little bit longer uh, due to that. But um, is there a motion to approve the meeting agenda? Steph, Steph moves. Anybody second? Lisa seconds. All in favor? Thank you. That passes unanimously, so we now have a meeting agenda. Uh, the next item is to approve the minutes of the prior meeting. Is there a, um, any comment on the minutes? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve them? Okay, Chris moves. Is there a second? Diane seconds. All in favor? Okay, that passes also unanimously, so the minutes are approved. Um, next, uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Hargens to give her superintendent's report, but um, before I do that, I'd like to give a really a, b a brief introduction um, to a topic on behalf, I believe, of the board um, and ask that Dr. Hargens address this in her, um, in her remarks. Um, this morning's newspaper contained an article on um, the number of, of um, restraints and seclusions in the district that I think everyone up here has heard um, a lot from uh, constituents about and has had um, individual concerns. Um, I think I speak on behalf of the board, most of whom I've spoken to about this when I say that we have both substantive questions about whether the um, treatment of the students is appropriate, but we very clearly have um, concerns about the um, accuracy and integrity of the information, um, both that um, is being reported to our various regulatory authorities, but also that this board is getting to make its decisions. Um, we understand that this is a very large organization, that it is highly regulated, and that getting the accurate facts in a big organization is, I mean, that is one of the biggest challenges when you have a widespread organization. Nonetheless, without accurate information, the board is really not uh, able to do its job effectively of monitoring what's going on. So, you know, we want to stick to our agenda tonight and not get derailed by the daily news, 
but I think we have to call that out um, and particularly ask you to respond on the issue of what, um, what we can do to assure the integrity of the data that, and the accuracy of the data that's coming before us. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Jones, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to address the issue that's been raised about the reporting of seclusions and restraints. Seclusions and restraints are techniques that are used to protect students from harming themselves or others. We have 896 staff members who are trained, and each time a technique is used, from an arm hold to a bear hug, every incident must be documented. We have documented those incidents in an internal system. Two years ago, the state asked for that data to be put in infinite campus. This created a situation where you had an internal database that was not communicating with an external database. The solution at that time was to have the reports entered into two separate databases and two separate systems. I first became aware that there was a data entry discrepancy last Thursday and immediately notified Commissioner Pruitt, outlining the steps we were taking to ensure the data we had collected through our internal system was moved into Infinite Campus. As of today, our internal reporting system has been shut down so that new cases cannot be inadvertently added to it instead of into the state system. So let me be very clear. These cases have been documented and the data is available. We have corrected the process that led to the discrepancy and are updating our numbers with the Kentucky Department of Education. I appreciate the support of the Kentucky Department of Education in recognizing the transparency and urgency with which we resolved this issue. I know this board has high expectations, as I do, and we understand the importance of being accurate and data informed. This issue highlights the process of continuously improving and building a data system of integrity. Going forward, per a conference call on Friday with myself and Chair Jones and our Director of Internal Audit, Jim Tenza from D Dean Dorton, we are asking our internal auditor to not only review our financial reporting, but to review our data reporting as well and to assess any risk in our current processes. So I appreciate the board's concern and attention to this issue. I also would like to share a few thoughts about the passing of Bellarmine University President Dr. Jay McGowan. Jay was our educational neighbor located just down Newburgh Road. He was one of the first per people to welcome me to the neighborhood when I became superintendent of JCPS. He was a person of integrity and vision, and he utilized those qualities to transform the campus and educational opportunities offered at Bellarmine. He was a leader and at heart, and what I appreciated most about him, he was always an educator. I appreciated the opportunity to work with him as we launched the Bellarmine Literacy Project. I am incredibly proud of the work we are accomplishing that is fundamentally transforming the way we teach reading in JCPS. Dr. McGowan's legacy will be a transformed campus just down the road, but also a new generation of readers here in JCPS. As I attended events in the past few days, the Women Business Owner of the Year's a Year Awards, and congratulations to board member Horn for being an award finalist, the Family Scholar House fundraising event, and the Louisville Urban League celebrating diversity, had a lot of fun there, I was reminded of our dedicated citizens who are working every day to make Louisville better. Board Chair, David Jones Jr. kicked off the JCPS Idea Festival on Friday, March 4th at the Kentucky Center for the Performing Arts. There were three main presentations done by students, Making the Dream Possible, Accepting Diversity, and Hearing for All. I am always proud to see 
our, our dedicated JCPS folks actively involved. Dr. Marco Munoz, Dr. John Marshall, Dr. Gwen Snow, and Ms. Ms. Mercaderes at Seoul, State of Latinos in Louisville on a Saturday morning. And the mayor was there as well. Uh, Dr. M Munoz did a great presentation about um, uh, the state of Latinos in JCPS. Principal Vicki Letty, more senior Lexi Nall, teacher and coach Kyle McCune, with the help of parents and community members, hosted an archery tournament after school at Moore High School from Friday through Saturday, which hosted 1,000 students and 50 different schools. What a great event. Chief Finance Officer Cordelia Hardin presented at the 2016 Kentucky School Boards Association Annual Conference at the Galt House on Saturday, February 27th. Her presentation was entitled, School Finance, No Matter Your Size, Monitoring the Budget Means Asking the Right Questions. Quip, quick update on the execution of Vision 2020. We have identified a project management tool to begin to track Vision 2020 progress, and this will allow us to demonstrate progress, progress and track it. In the monthly update for Louisville Linked, a system to link supports with student needs, 54,674 links were made through the six pupil month, serving 153 school sites and 24,290 students. JCPS teachers, Missy Calloway, Josh Rhodes, Sarah Yost, and Mimi Ratliff joined teachers from across Kentucky at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations, elevating and celebrating effective teaching and teachers conference in San Diego recently. These teacher leaders are creating opportunities to elevate and celebrate teachers and support their colleagues in their work to ensure all students achieve at high levels. In preparation to implement the new federal education law known as Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, Kentucky Commissioner of Education Stephen Pruitt is hosting a series of education town hall meetings. A town hall meeting is scheduled for Thursday, April 21st from 6.30 to 8 at Seneca High School at the Stickler Theater. Um, Chair Jones, I pulled item 9M2, approval of memorandum of agreements and counseling services contract for behavioral and mental health services, and we'll bring that back at the next board meeting. So this concludes my report and my recommendation for approval of the consent agenda later at the meeting. Thank you, Dr. Hargens. Um, the next item is an action item. Um, would you like to introduce our distinguished visitor? Absolutely. Um, if, if Jim Allen uh, would come uh, actually to the um, table or the podium, whichever you feel more comfortable yeah. with. We have always had a great uh, working relationship with the Jefferson County Public Education Foundation, but we have a new memorandum of agreement um, and a new executive director, and it's an honor to have you here, Jim, and I'll turn it over to you to describe the agreement. That's great. Just before I do that real quickly, I just want to say thank you uh, for your acknowledgement of uh, Jay McGowan. As a Bellarmine trustee, I have witnessed firsthand his integrity, character, incredible talents, and unbelievable attention to detail. He will really be missed. Thank you. And if I could just pile a little bit on the introduction of Jim. Jim is the Chief Executive Officer of Hilliard and Lyons and um, I think um, an exemplar of the tremendous support that uh, JCPS has from the business community and the broader civic community. So great. take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. As uh, Dr. Hall or Hargens acknowledged, uh, the Je Jefferson County Public Education Foundation has been in existence for 33 years. It was just a year ago and has been attached to the Jefferson County Public Schools for the bulk of that history. Just a year ago, we created uh, separation from JCPS, an independent location. Um, we used the Louisville Community Foundation for our, our office. Uh, Sam Corbett was hired as our executive director. We have independently funded that position um, and are doing so with the idea of becoming a more effective advocacy organization for the school system, more effective fundraising uh, organization, and feel that this independent structure will serve us well. 
we are still relying on the Jefferson County Public Schools for some administrative support and uh, have formalized a memorandum of understanding just to ensure that we've got the proper governance, governance and the appropriate oversight for what we are uh, pursuing. Um, things like Everyone Reads, we've been actively involved in, Five Star Schools uh, and the Ford NGL. We were essentially the liaison between Ford and the school system as a master plan was developed and as we work towards uh, further implementation. In fact, Sam Corbett is in Nashville coming home today with a big group from Louisville as part of a Ford gathering down there. So I think everybody has had the opportunity to review the memorandum of understanding. And so if there are any questions, happy to answer those. Okay. Mr. Brady, would you begin the question? First of all, thank you for your continued support for our school system. And we're so happy to have that, um, that type of support. My question re regarding this, um, this memorandum is, would there ever be a time where the foundation might take a different track from what the school district's position might be on an issue? Uh, I'm glad you asked that question. And the answer is our goal is to have our uh, mission uh, aligned with that of the superintendent. So I would not anticipate that we would ever go uh, a separate direction from her agenda. It's always been uh, that we've had this alignment. And in creating this separation, it's really to create, uh, again, I think a, a better platform, a more objective platform for advocacy, better platform for fundraising and supporting the critical initiatives of the district that require separate fundraising. But we would never anticipate that we would be on a different page. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Chris. Are there other questions? Um, I, have, I have one. Um, I just want to um, ask, um, you know, there's a lot in the news now about the um, complexity at U of L because of the um, <coughs> different boards of the U of L Foundation from the um, University of Louisville board. And um, I guess the specific question is, is there any set of circumstances under which um, the Jefferson County Public Education Foundation would um, pay compensation to an employee um, or officer of JCPS without um, involving the, um, the board here or our successors? Uh, absolutely not. So okay. the, I guess the good thing there is we've got very limited funding, so we don't really have the capacity. <laughs> that's really uh, not good. And, but. <laughs> that's, we, we really don't have the capacity to do that. So all of our, uh, we, in other words, we've got very little in the way of discretionary dollars. All of the funds that we raise are pretty much project specific. Right. Uh, and so uh, I don't think we would have the capacity to do that, nor would we ever uh, choose to do that. Okay, and if I could ask our council, is there anything in the MOU, the actual language, does it close the door on any kind of, um, you know, sort of, it's really the same question in a more specific way that Mr. Brady asked, disjointed um, activities, but. All right, well, a, a couple of comments on that, and the uh, University of Louisville has some governance concerns that are not present here, and that the president of the university is also the president of their foundation and uh, four members of the UOL board of trustees are also members of their mm -hmm. of the board of their foundation uh, those governance issues do not exist here the, the the board of education and the board of the foundation are separate uh, with regard to payments directly to the superintendent or another employee uh, that would actually violate the Kentucky school laws uh, it is uh, proper under Kentucky law for a private donor to make payments to a public agency, including salary supplements, but those grants and gifts have to be made directly to the public agency, not to an individual. So direct payments to the superintendent uh, would violate that law. Uh, and then finally, uh, there are controls in the memorandum of understanding uh, that uh, the financial records of the foundation, to the extent they're prepared and maintained by uh, employees of the school district, which as Mr. Allen uh, mentioned, uh, school district employees provide those services. Uh, those are, and the uh, foundation has agreed in the memorandum of understanding, 
uh, subject to the open records law, so they are fully uh, available to the district's auditors and even the public. And then finally, the MOU provides that the foundation shall present to the board every year uh, its financial audit and also its IRS Form 990, which can be reviewed by the board uh, for accuracy against the financial records. So I, I don't see any real opportunity, uh, even if the foundation wanted to do that, which as Mr. Allen said, they, they don't want to. Great, okay, well thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Okay, Diane. Um, I just wanted to thank the foundation for all that you've done for this board and for this district, particularly when uh, we uh, hired a new superintendent and there were lots of things that we were trying to do to pull the team together. So uh, I know we had to ask for your help and the foundation's help. So thank you for making us better, more efficient, and more effective. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much. And we've got a great foundation board. And um, we wouldn't want to engage in any of the things that you wouldn't want us to engage in. Right, so right. anyhow. Yeah. yeah. I am sorry for bringing a, uh, you know, <laughs> whatever it is, a dark lining to the silver cloud of no. your wonderful support. But uh, Not at thank all. you. Thank you very much. We have to do our diligence. Is there a Understand. motion to approve the MOU? Chris uh, moves it. Diane seconds it. All in favor? Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you so much Great. for being thank here with us tonight. Me. Great job and look forward to continued good work together. All right, um, on to the next item, which is an information item, which Dr. Hargens, you may introduce. Absolutely, one of the most positive things we have uh, going for us in JCPS is the joint commitment we have to improve educational outcomes with Metro government and with our mayor. So it's an honor to have Mayor Greg <coughs> Fisher here to talk about the Cradle to Career Pipeline. Thank you for being here, Mr. Mayor. You guys for letting me be here. I too have got to say something about Jay. Uh, and he, he would want this to be a teaching moment. So I think, you know, Jay McGowan was all about setting big goals and big vision. And when he stated that Bellarmine would become the Notre Dame of the South, a lot of people laughed at him, frankly. And that really ticked me off. And he just put his head down and he went about doing it. So I think Jay taught us about setting big goals and he also taught us how to win as a community and he wasn't concerned with the naysayers he just said let's keep rolling here he's inclusive he's inspiring and one of the true renaissance men that all of us have ever met from reciting irish poetry to being an all-star high school basketball player and everything in between so if there's anybody that deserves to be flying with the angels tonight it's certainly jay mcgowan okay um well, this partnership uh, with JCPS, between the city and JCPS, is something that we spend a huge amount of time on because it is so important to, the, to our city and the future of our city. And obviously, I know that the, whomever the mayor is does not control JCPS, but I believe whomever the mayor is should have a super strong partnership with JCPS because these 100,000 kids are citizens, they're our future leaders, and there is certainly work in the community that's being done that we need to align properly. We need to identify the right needs. And so it only makes sense to me that the city is an important part of that. Uh, Dr. Hargens uh, did not flinch when we started uh, talking about a compact between JCPS and the city, because I believe she shares some of those same characteristics that we just talked about with Dr. McGowan. Uh, she wants nothing but what's good for the kids. And she, she knows I will be not just an enthusiastic supporter, but also a critical friend as well. And she said, that's fine. It is what it is. The data is what it is. And we need to do better for our kids. So I appreciate the culture, uh, Dr. Hargens, that you live by and that JCPS also lives by as well. So let's talk about a little bit about what it is. So this is my annual update to you guys that you allow me to come in and talk about this partnership between JCPS and the city. And what the partnership is based on, obviously, is that we are a city of lifelong learning. That's our value number one for the city. And we have to have a goal of being the best large public urban public school district in the country, period. And what I've said uh, to Dr. Hargens is as long as we are pursuing that goal and vocal about that goal, you've got a supporter here. When we start saying, well, I don't know if we can do that, then I would say, why not? Because our kids deserve that. And I understand it's a long, hard journey. but intention basically is the critical thing to start this. This partnership also is a follow-on to the Greater Louisville Education Commitment to work toward the ambitious goal that was stated with it some six plus years ago. 
And that commitment for our city is to provide a world-class, seamless, and coordinated education system that provides ample opportunities for developing creativity and critical thinking, skilled workers, engaged citizens, and civic leaders. So we all know we're on this journey together. It's an imperfect journey, full of imperfect people, but we're getting after it and doing the best we can with this noble goal. You can see on the slide what the three big goals are, having kids ready for school, successful in school, and then prepared to succeed. What the pledge is all about is Louisville Metro government has said we'll work every day to raise educational attainment and build not just a college going culture, but a college completing culture as well. So one of the primary things we learned through the data of 55K is we got plenty of people going to college or have college, but completing it is another issue. And then JCPS said they'll focus on the goals and strategy to prepare all of its students for college, career, and life in a globally competitive environment. So we're all very much aware of the issues of social mobility. Uh, the zip code that we're born in cannot be the destiny for our human potential. And then secondly, the whole issue of a global economy. And the facts are, and we see it right now with some of the uh, uh, dialogue, if you want to be gentle, gentle and call it that, with our presidential debates, the world has changed more rapidly than some people's ability to adapt to it. And we are going to be in an increasingly rapidly changing global world. So our ability to have lifelong learning has never been more important. And the sooner we get everybody on board with that, the better we will be. It's all about tying the cradle to career to jobs as well. And it's not, it's an intentional career pathing to where we have specific job openings in our community around our economic development cluster where we just can't fill those jobs. So we want our students to understand what those clusters are. We also want our students to understand what kind of living that they can make with that. And then hopefully where they find joy in education can line up with those jobs. What we do, obviously, is support and advocate for education. And we do that through a variety of ways. We regularly meet uh, with the superintendent's cabinet and my cabinet. Dr. Hargens and I meet individually every other month as well to talk about opportunities, issues going on in the community so we can make sure we're leveraging each other's resources. We want to see other facilities that we can jointly use. We've done that with our learning centers. Uh, we want to support extended learning opportunities like I've referenced with out of school time. The cultural pass was a huge thing for our community. We're going into our third year of that now where our underserved, low income kids have got a cultural pass where they can experience our museums, our art centers. Oftentimes we hear that they've never had this type of exposure before. So while we talk about the educational gap in the community, the experiential gap is just as critical because that's what sparks a student's imagination and possibilities for what can be. And when we see our kids that are struggling the most, they feel disconnected and they feel hopeless because oftentimes their, out, our, their outlook for the world is just the block around where they live. Our job is to increase that, those experiences for them. Grant development, we just were jointly awarded a, a Children in Nature's Planning Grant for JCPS in Louisville. These foundations like when they see a city and a school board, school system working together, because they don't see that in a lot of places. I'm going to talk more in a second about really a blockbuster that we were jointly awarded with the Harvard Graduate School of Education here in a minute. And then probably, you know, I was almost say most importantly, but this has got to be good. And this is our data sharing and coordination. It is easy to see because of what we know now uh, with kids that don't optimize their potential, we understand if we go back in their lives and we see the same patterns happening with these kids. So how are we with our data sharing? Is our data database ro robust enough so that we can predict who the students are that are going to have trouble and can we intervene at the appropriate time? And I'll address that more here in a second. But that, that would be the gold standard of where we want to go as a community. You all have seen the Cradle to Career. Uh, this work developed out of our 55,000 degree initiative. Our executive director is here, Mary Gwen Wheeler. And as we got together with 55,000 degrees, some obvious questions started being asked. What do we want our students to be prepared for? What kind of jobs? That's the output. On the input side, it's like, why do we have so much remedial education with these kids? And then when we're, talk when we're starting to talk about K to 12 cluster, the second cluster, the other question that came up is, you know, why do some kids show up three years behind other kids in kindergarten at the age of six? And imagine having that kind of sentence around your neck when you're six years old. You don't even know what life's going to be, but 90% of those kids never get ahead. And morally and economically, that is not right for our city. So this is a system of lifelong learning. We have ownership for each of the pillars that I'll be talking about 
here in a second, as well as action networks uh, with, uh, within Cradle to Career. Let's talk about each of the pillars briefly. First is early care and education and getting kids ready for kindergarten. This pillar is owned by Metro United Way. They've attacked it enthusiastically. We, we provide specifically in this pillar on providing more children access to high quality education setting, settings to get them ready for college. We as a community have a goal, as you all know, of getting 77% of our children ready for kindergarten, kindergarten by 2020. So we work around those with the goal of getting 100% of our kids ready. And I wouldn't want to be one of those 23%. I'd just like that. We don't want that. So we have more than 50 community representatives, representatives along with Metro government that are partners in this work. We have kindergarten readiness camps at the Duval Education Center, the Unselled Early Childhood Center, and McFerrin Elementary. This was made possible by JCPS, the Jefferson County Education Foundation, thank you, Jim Allen, and the CENS Foundation. Thank you, Professor Jones. So this is what we're seeing here is integrating the system and we're seeing some very good results, especially when it comes to some of these high quality pre-K programs that are dramatically moving kids toward that Brigance readiness score. Not long, is it six weeks? Not expensive in the big realm of things, but huge results. So as a community, we don't think anything about, well, we do think about it, but we regularly incarcerate people at the cost of $25,000 a year. And I would submit, and the data shows us, that some of these are the kids that start off three years behind. Wouldn't it be much wiser to make that investment of several hundred, five hundred, a thousand dollars in those kids early on? K to 12. What we found here as we went through 55,000 degrees is we can have an educational strategy, but if we don't have an equity strategy and address that issue of social mobility that I talked about, not just in the classroom, but health, social services, social and emotional well-being, we're just not going to be successful. So we've pushed 55K. We're, we're kind of stuck on 41.7 now. We're 41.2 last year. We had been making more progress than that before. And we've made good progress from where we started at 36. But to get to 50%, we've got to pick it up. So as we dive deeper into the data, we see these type of opportunities. So there's some things that can help, like the third grade uh, reading pledge. Uh, particularly important as we look at the data for our students of low income, our kids of color, and especially our boys of color, as we know. Out of School Time has been an active partner. JCPS has been an active partner with our Out of School Time uh, Council. That whole system now is called Blocks, and efforts there have included professional development for providers, uh, youth worker certificates, and then data coordination and support. The progress we're making with our career pathway culture is really exciting, and we've made a big leap this year with that. And that can be at Iroquois High School with the kids that are going into uh, construction. It can be in some of our technology schools, the Advanced Manufacturing uh, Center. Just yesterday we announced our, officially announced our Summer Works program for the year. UPS steps up and offers 100 kids the chance to change their life. Our juniors in high school now, if they qualify to work at UPS this summer, and then stick with it next year, then they're in college, the JCPS pays for their way through college, so they're making money and getting a college degree. And we all know that access to income uh, is one of the critical barriers for a college degree, be it two years or four years degree. So please spread that message wide and far. And yesterday, as I mentioned, we announced it, we had 130 JCPS kids sign up last night after six o'clock to midnight. So they were watching the news, somebody was watching the news, and they went to our website at summerworks.org and you can sign up either as a student or an employer. And what we're trying to do is get every employer in the community have summer works as part of their culture. So when you're talking to somebody in another business, you want to say, tell me about your summer works program, Chuck. What are you guys doing? What have you learned? We got 10 kids this year. Well, we started this year with one. Or in the case of UPS, they have 100. GE has 100. Boston is the best in the country at this. They've been at it for 35 years. We're in the top five we've got a ways to go before we catch up with them. So I'm really excited about our development. We're going to probably have about 2,700, 2,800 kids with summer jobs this year. And when we started five years ago, we were at 200. So we're making good progress there. The Trees Louisville program is a, is a fun program. Our goal is to make each JCPS campus an arboretum. 
So think when kids come to school, they see the beauty of nature, the beauty of these big trees that grow around here. And right now, we get it. I mean, your all's budget is tight, and trees sometimes are, well, let's put it in the classroom instead. So through the Trees Louisville Foundation that we started three or four months ago, that's one of their initiatives to plant 800, 800 trees on 11 campuses throughout the city. We also uh, want to see more kids participating in kindergarten, kindergarten readiness uh, classes. Children participating in the initiative that I referred to earlier showed remarkable improvement, getting their measurement to 71%. And I think, uh, Dr. Hargens, they started out around 46 or 50%, does that sound right? 50. Mm -hmm. 50%. So in a six-week program, you make 50% improvement, and you're almost at our Brigant's uh, measurement. So as smart people, we've got to ask, how can we invest in that area? It doesn't cost as much, but gets us big returns. Then other programs like A Thousand Books uh, Before Kindergarten, as well known in the community. We had the Providence Children, Child Care and Preschool double the goal, read 2,000 books. And it was just a matter of intentionality. They said, there, we're going to read 2,000 books. You don't have to read 2,000 separate books, Linda. But it's that whole process of sitting down, reading, having that child in your lap. You guys understand how critical it is. And then our Compassionate Schools Project is granting international recognition for what it's doing. It's in three pilot schools. Uh, we're teaching kids K to 5, and it's funded by an ex external agencies. We're teaching them how to deal with uh, so social and emotional well-being stressors. We're teaching them about nutrition and wellness, and then we're teaching them about mind uh, mindfulness. So for some of the kids, uh, we're doing this in uh, high, high challenge schools, it's the first time in their lives, is what they tell us and what the teachers tell us as well, where the kids have been calm with an open mind. And I call these programs open mind, open heart. And if you're coming to school and you're coming from an environment that's basically a post-traumatic stress environment, it is hard to learn. And so what we're seeing with the Compassionate Schools Project is we're breaking that cycle. Next year, the plan is to go to 10 schools, again, with all external funding. But as you all watch that, I would encourage you all to watch what the return on investment is here. Because I believe in education, we're not going to just kind of continuously improve our way to the promised land. We need some breakthrough approaches, and the Compassionate School Project is one of those. Next is our uh, high school to post-secondary transition, what we call 21st century uh, workforce. Uh, summer works is a big part of that. I just referred to that. So giving kids ages 16 to 21 a work experience tied in with a, an employer that hopefully will track that kid all the way through high school. And as I mentioned now, we're tying the interest of the kid much more closely to the job. Where we need help here is, as you all know, there are not enough counselors in your schools. I think your ratio is, what, 400 to 1 or 450 to 1, something like that. In order to get this program where we need it, we need to get that down to about 200 to 1 so that each child is named and claimed and we know <laughs> what their interest is and we know the employers in the surrounding areas of where they live so we can match that up. And I just believe if that child can find joy in work, that will translate to joy in education and a better academic outcome as well. Our career mobile app, uh, what that is, is about now you can go online and say, uh, like this great success story we had yesterday from a gal named Megan, uh, how much money can I make if I become a registered nurse, registered nurse? And she became part of our high school program, went to Norton Healthcare, Norton Health paid for her college, she's now an RN, and she attributes a lot of that success to the Summer Works program. And I imagine she's making forty-five to $55,000 now. So you can go on this app and understand what that career looks like for you. LinkedIn, we're trying to get every kid to have a digital resume. Even if there's not a lot on there, if you don't have a digital resume in today's world, you're invisible for the most part. And what we see with kids that get their digital resumes, it gives them a little pep in their step as well. And then last is Code Louisville, and that is a software coding uh, opportunity that we've had that we, our city has really embraced this. President Obama uh, identified us as a tech hire city when he visited here last year to, uh, to support and promote uh, our Code Louisville. And then we had an exceptional program that you all should be very proud of. And it was a group of Ballard High School kids that, leave at, that live at Beecher Terrace. They went through Code Louisville, and then we asked ourselves with SummerWorks, what are we going to do with these young leaders? You know, they say, well, it'll pay off for you in the future. No, we did our first startup with SummerWorks. So these seven leaders from Beecher Terrace formed a company, and Ted Smith was their advisor, called Beach Technologies. And they went through the process then of, of signing up 25 customers over the course of the month for website development and social media applications as well. 
So I don't want to hear from anybody that kids can't learn. I don't want to hear from anybody that you know, where they live is going to test their destiny. Because if, if we can intervene and they get help, these kids can learn. And these, in the case with these kids, they are technology entrepreneurs. That's pretty cool. Now, what's next for Cradle to Career? One thing that Mary Gwen and I have talked about a lot, and others, Katie and Ashley over here, is uh, how do we make sure this system of lifelong learning uh, sustains any uh, mayor's uh, term? So, uh, you know, once I'm gone, uh, will the next mayor say this is valuable for our community? So we have to figure out what we're going to do from a governance standpoint so that we can have top leadership in the community pulling all of these pillars together. Because you can see the uh, imperative for excellence within the pillar, but then between the pillars as well. So that's an issue that we're working on right now. How do we go after equity? We've talked about that as well. And family engagement, social services, and health <coughs> interventions. We know what the top problem is with getting a good education for most people. is poverty. And coming from a family that doesn't have resources that can ensure those kids are at school every day, they're being stimulated with out of school time, and the difference between our kids that have the resources and that don't, re don't have the resources is something as a city that we've got to address. We just can't moan and shake our heads. These are our future employees, our future leaders, and it's morally wrong for them not to come along for this ride into what is a very exciting 21st century. Then the other thing we've got to talk about here is what role will the Harvard Education Redesign Lab, it's called By All Means, and Say Yes to Education play. So we're one of the few cities in the country that have really defined what we are calling the system of lifelong learning. Most cities that you go to, you don't have this type of dialogue going on. You don't have the four pillars talking to each other. You don't have a Greater Louisville Project collecting the data because there's too much politics and people are interested in their silos. And one thing I am very proud about our city is we get together and we work on big issues. And we leave the egos at the door and say it's about the outcome, it's about our kids. So we're in a good place on some of these leading edge organizations like Harvard and say yes to learn from them. So the Harvard uh, Consortium, uh, we had a uh, serendipitous encounter with them in Boston uh, where I was describing Cradle to Career and then they were next and described that they were looking for a half dozen cities in the country that had a systems view toward learning and were interested in addressing the social determinants that kept kids from learning. You know, it's like, hey, can we get involved? So they were very keen on working with us. You can see they'll be addressing social and emotional learning barriers, social service and health interventions, out of school time, and personalized learning. Personalized learning, so taking it by each kid. What is the right intervention at the right time in the right place? And who can help if the family can't help get that child there? This is all eminently doable with data that we have. As long as we build a robust enough uh, database, our predictive tools come into play, and then we have the background in the city, the social services in the city to get this done. So we'll be starting with, by all means, uh, in I think the next, what, three months or so? May, and, and our team, our core team is made up of myself, Dr. Hargens, uh, Joe Tolan, our representative from the Metro United Way since he is uh, retiring, Mary Gwen with 55K, Michael Gritton, Kentucky and Works has really come on in the last four years with what, what they're doing with workforce training. The Urban League will be representative. Our foundation community will be representative through the Brown Foundation. Our, our uh, mental health uh, services through Tony Zippo at Seven Counties. And then Yvette Gentry who works for Louisville Metro and is over all of our community building. And then we'll have staff that will be helping us as well. But this is a great cross-functional team that we will have a learning cohort, a mutual learning cohort with five other cities in Boston that will be able to say how are we learning from each other, what's working there, what's not working there. So this is really exciting because it identified where we were at in terms of our ability to move forward with 55K and cradle time that we were looking for. So we're very optimistic about that. Now, another <coughs> approach is say yes. Uh, we're looking at exploring a partnership opportunity with say yes. This appears to address many of the issues that the Harvard program is, but it has a component to it uh, that we really, frankly, have to assess if we can do it as a community. And that's full tuition, last dollar scholar scholarships for public high school graduates. Uh, in the three cities that they're working right now, Syracuse, Buffalo, and Greensboro, in Syracuse and Buffalo, they have fully funded this endowment. So basically, the message they're saying to their students in their community is regardless of where you live, regardless of what your family's financial um, opportunities are or challenges, we will get you to college. So imagine in our city if we developed this system 
with our learning system, our social service and health system, and then a pathway to a degree. You know, that's exciting. And we'd be one of the leading cities in the world to do that. And so we're assessing what the uh, challenges are with that and whether or not that's a realistic goal for us. But we will definitely learn from them on the social service and health obstacles as well. So what am I asking for? Uh, obviously, you all have already signed up. And Dr. Hargens and our team uh, talked at length about whether or not we had the resources to uh, go for the By All Means Consortium. We agreed that we did, so we've been partners from day one on that. So we'll need some resources that uh, you all have already committed to. The kindergarten readiness camps. Can we find some more money for those? It is a low dollar, high return way to accelerate our kids. With our city budget, we don't you know, fund JCPS typically. Last year, we put a couple hundred thousand dollars into kindergarten readiness to see what we could learn by being engaged in that. So can you all find more money in the budget that you have, or foundations find more? Data coordination, so we can build these seamless, seamless databases that we talked about, is obviously important so that we can make good decisions. And then last is cross-pillar communications and coordination. What we found by the folks that owned each one of the silos, when they come to a cradle-to-career meeting, the sensitivity of the owners of those pillars goes way up because now they're talking to the pillars on the right and left of them and hearing what's working and what's not working. So we're able to build our system out in a more prudent and intelligent way so that we're producing students that are able to compete in this rapidly changing 21st century. So it's an exciting time. When you think about five years ago, none of this existed. And we have all kinds of uh, relationships and collaboration going on in the city around our kids at a super important time. So we're going to keep doing the work. There's no silver or there's no instant pudding on any of this type of thing. It's just getting after it every day, attacking some of uh, sacred cows if they're out there and focus on making sure the kids and our workers are the focus of this. So we'll keep at it. So with that, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to say hello. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we are grateful to you for coming here tonight. Do you want to take any questions or comments sure. or anything? Yeah. Anybody have any uh, questions or requests for clarification? Linda and then Chris. I have a question, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, in kindergarten, kindergarten readiness goal, that 77%, we have an, a special challenge because the JCPS will touch 4,400 of those kids, and then there's the 3,300 out there that that we don't touch, that we can't seem to gather into to kindergarten. Does the city have any thoughts about how we can can reach those that are not the ones that we serve, the the ones that are at daycares, the ones that are are away from us, and so that we can make that 77% a little more achievable. When, when you serve 60%, you right. can get 100% of them. Yep. But it's, I mean, that's what we would aim for, but does the city have any thoughts about that? Absolutely, and so United Way owns that pillar, so we work with them with the other 50 partners in there to say, how can we reach these very kids that you're talking about? So there's a texting strategy that we're exploring in other areas, making sure these programs are available at unlikely places so people know. It could be at a health clinic, it could be at a community center. Because what we find oftentimes with non-participating parties is they just didn't know. And they might have a lifestyle where, you know, free flow communication is not something that they do. So we need kind of a guerrilla effort to make sure we're contacting these folks where they live. So I'm sure this pillar could give you a, a summary of the strategies, if you like. All right. Thank you. Okay. Chris? Thank you. Uh, first of all, Mayor Fisher, thank you for coming here. We really appreciate the close relationship we have with your administration, with you, and uh, with Metro Government. Um, it's very striking that there's a lot of cities out there that don't have that close relationship, but we're very, we feel very fortunate yeah. we have that. And we and thanks for coming back again. I know you were here yeah. about this time last year. That's right. Um, so I got a couple of things I'd like you to consider. And I'm going to take a little bit of a strange way of getting here. Uh, as you know, we mentioned earlier, the superintendent mentioned Louisville Linked, which is a great resource. Uh, it's something that helps us to wrap around service to help our, uh, our students, but it also helps the community at large as a kind of a one point, uh, single portal of contact, uh, one, one stop shop, if you will. And we also have our Family Resource and Youth Services Center. Now, as you know, the governor's budget has talked about eliminating those funds 
it appears, at least according to the election results that I've seen, that the Democrats will hold their, at least their majority within the House. But that doesn't mean it's a done deal that right. those funds won't be touched. Um, the district has for many years been supplementing the reductions in the, bu in the budget for those family re youth resource or re family resource youth services centers. And, and, it, and it, since it's not a done deal, we might end up having to put more money into that. Um, my understanding is that the city doesn't necessarily charge the metro parks, for example, for the water it uses because we own the water company and we own our sewage. Mm -hmm. According to our budget folks, uh, our, the district spends uh, $1.5 million per year for water and $2.5 million per year for sewage. And if there was a way we might be able to get in on that deal, <laughs> if you will, uh, that would greatly help us fund, you know, maybe redirect some of those fundings to be funds to support our friskies and therefore support the community. Um, so there's board support for that? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's so easy to spend other people's we're, money. We're bridging, I'm and, a, bridging and bonding, aren't we? <laughs> uh, well, and I, well, let me also preference this by saying if I don't ask, I know the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, so, no. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> the other thing we talked that you talked about, and I'm really glad to hear that, is the, the sense of data exchange where we are, you know, because we have a wealth of data. Um, you know, our data folks can, can pull together a lot of different things from a demographic standpoint, and we, and we gather so much information about our children and the families that we serve. Um, our our, this district has been committed to diversity, and unfortunately, the housing patterns, as you know, in Jefferson County are just not diverse. And the Supreme Court has kind of weighed in on this. I know Metro government is looking at creating more affordable housing everywhere. Right. But we've kind of done this to ourselves through zoning. And as a result of that, I don't know if, you know, we're kind of holding the community, at least in my view, we're holding the community together so we're not having the issues that say a Ferguson is having or Cincinnati or a Baltimore because of what I feel is our commitment to diversity. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to zoning, we can only do that for so long, right? I wonder if there's a way that, you, that the administration could consider or metro government would consider having a representative from the district on the, boning, on a, on the uh, zoning board. Uh, because we do have all this information and I know that sometimes those, the zoning decisions that are made might benefit from the wealth of information that we have within, you know, at our fingertips. And it's, I wish I can take, take credit for the idea for you know, funding with the water and also for, uh, you know, my BOZA uh, recommendation, but these come from constituents and it's something that as a board member I have to pass on, but sure. I found those as being two really compelling uh, things to possibly consider. Right. And I know well, I'm putting you on the spot, so well, no, I, I you, apologize. I'm used to it, so that's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, what the work we're going to do with by all means and possibly say yes if we work with them also is what they've found in Buffalo and Syracuse is when they've leaned out the existing social services processes and redesigned those, they were able to increase the services offered basically at the same amount of resources being spent in the community. So I'd recommend we start down that path. The, the water and MSD thing basically, if that occurred, basically that's just a transfer of citizens' revenue from the city to the school board without mm -hmm. them having a say in that. So there's, that's a little touchy, as you know. I can so, understand that. So we, let's, let's go through the leaning out and redesigning of the process of our social services as a first step. Uh, and you are absolutely correct on, you know, people that complain about busing, well, if we had, sit, if we had diverse housing patterns throughout the city, we wouldn't need to have bu busing. You know, and people say, well, I want my kids to have, uh, be able to choose where I go, I want it to be uh, diverse, and I want it to be close. Well, it's hard to meet all three of those sometimes, right? Now, it wouldn't be if we had diverse housing patterns. So we have uh, passed some ordinances, and we've attempted to pass some ordinances that some of the Metro Council has not appreciated relative to further diversifying our housing patterns. So when that comes up, we'll communicate with you all so perhaps you can bring your constituent voices to bear on that. And as it relates to putting somebody in the planning and zoning, that's an interesting idea, so let us get back with you on that. Thank you. Oh, and may I say one more thing? The last time we spoke, I had asked about free Wi-Fi. You all have Ted Smith and your group, and I also say I put in a plug for Teresa Reno Weber yeah. because she worked at our uh, technology board. Fantastic support, so thank you again. But I really appreciate you looking at the trash cans that are Wi Fi hotspots. That's just fantastic yeah. work, so thanks for it. Well, let your voices be heard. You know, some of our representatives think that's all, you know, lefty, West Coast kind of <laughs> stuff. And the bottom line is any serious growing city is progressive when it comes to environmental responsibility and broadband. 
So let's be loud about gotta that. Got to do it. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Who else? We can't let him get away. Oh, you got a yeah. long meeting here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to uh, quickly make a comment that goes back to Ms. Duncan's uh, comment about the children in early childhood education that do not come to JCPS. One of the things that you have done very well is to bring people together to think all thoughts. And I happen to be serving with the uh, Russell community on the Russell Transformation Plan. So we have looked at the 19 to 21 child care centers in that uh, area to talk about what we can do to upgrade and to bring professional development to those centers. So although they may not be coming to us, I think we are beginning to have conversations about what we as a community can do to reach out to enhance uh, training and education for our early childhood students. Yeah, thank you. I think one of the things we're doing in this city, and I think we should all be proud of it, is there's scores of discussions taking place about race relations, uh, civil rights 2.0, 4.0, wherever we are on this. And that is so critical for a city so that we can, you know, look at people as people, not focus on secondary differences of skin color or faith or whatever it might be, and look at those inequities that plague our community in some areas so that we can bring the proper resources to bear on that. So to the extent that JCPS is part of that discussion, I want to thank you all for that. And I would encourage you too to let's keep it going and let's push the edge. I mean, the, the goal is unclear in terms of intermediate goals. The end goal is very clear to me. And that is every citizen in our community has the platforms to thrive and flourish. And how do we eliminate those barriers for folks that have those barriers? So there's a lot of steps between that statement, that's how we define compassion in our city, and where we're at today. But I'm encouraged by the dialogue in the community of people rallying around that, addressing issues in a non-defensive way, around uh, white privilege, around the legacy of slavery, whatever it might be. And those are hard conversations for people to have. But you've got to have the conversation to get through that barrier so we can get to where we want to be. So I'd encourage you all to do as much as you can in that area. Great. OK. One other um, thing, I, I, I was informed that I skipped the genesis of Cradle to Career, and that was the 55,000 degree slide. So I just want to emphasize, I think everybody knows 55,000 degrees and what its goal is for the community. But Having 55,000 degrees is what provide the platform for us to create the cradle to career. So, Mayor Gunn Wheeler, thank you. All right, great. Mr. Mayor, thank you for being here. I think um, the focus on the wraparound services and the out of school time, and I think, uh, you know, particularly the idea that by um, working hard to coordinate, uh, to try to wring more um, service to more kids out of the dollars that we have. That is something that's going to be really important. I think we're all delighted to hear you focused on that. Um, also, um, this has appropriately been focused on the adult world, um, but I also want to thank you for coming to JCPS's Idea Festival the other day. Um, it's a big, big thrill for the students when you show up and mix it up with them. And um, that is really important testament to the yeah. importance of education in the community. So thanks for being sure. with us tonight. I love that. And JCPS Idea Festival that's shows us that the world is our oyster. It's and gonna it is get, so inspiring That's where we see to it's going to get better. That's yeah. exactly right. Thank you all for your service. Good. Thank you very much. All right. Um, now we get to move on to the really exciting part of the agenda <laughs> with the consent calendar. Um, so Dr. Hargens has previously recommended it. And um, we had one uh, request um, to, uh, related to an item which Dr. Hargens mentioned that she had pulled down and deferred for a couple weeks to do some more work on. So um, if there's nothing else to pull down, I would entertain a motion to approve it. Actually, we've, yeah, is there a motion to approve it? Diane moves, is there a second? Okay, uh, Lisa, all in favor? Aye. Great. Uh, the consent calendar has now been passed. Yes, Lisa. You are right. Lisa has just made a motion to accept the mayor's report, I believe, and Chris seconds it. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. I'm gonna, I am going to get the hang of this one of these years. I'm sure. So, uh, okay. Um, Okay, now it's my pleasure to introduce Vice Chair Diane Porter to draw lots for the tie bid. We have a tie bid. One of the most exciting parts of the evening here. So. Uh, this is item one and two on bid 
7201 for flashlights, batteries, etc. And there's one draw for two <coughs> items and it is awarded to Batteries Plus Store 813. Okay, thank you very much for um, drawing on the tie bid. Um, next, we're going to move into the board planning calendar. And again, um, note that our agenda is slightly different um, tonight. Um, we've moved to the point where we now have a separate item for the board planning calendar and then board reports. I'd like to um, ask that um, as we talk about the planning calendar, let's see if we can use this time to um, not only just approve it, um, but if there are questions, let's discuss things. Oh, do we have to vote on the tie bid? Man, I am missing it. All right, <laughs> Steph, I believe, was that a motion? Okay, we move, Steph moves, Chuck seconds to vote on the tie bid. All in favor, aye. Great. Sorry about that. <coughs> Is too excited to get onto the planning calendar, um, but let's do um, you know let's discuss um, you know what's here, what's missing, what um, you know if there are um, questions or concerns about particularly how we're rolling into getting the pieces of the um, strategy into focus. I know we've had a lot of conversation. I've had a lot of input from you all about how to do that, but. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess um, if there are new items, I think, Chris, do you want to kick us off if I can turn to you? I know you had something you were thinking about. Sure. And so, you know, I, I want to, first of all, um, kind of piggyback and talk about a concern that you mentioned earlier in the meeting and that Dr. Hargens was addressing in her comments, and that's this issue of data integrity. Um, you know, as we talked about, as you know, the chair mentioned before, there's a story out regarding some of the, uh, the way the district has been reporting on some of this information. And my concern really comes from a point of view of, you know, we keep saying that we're a data informed district, that, you know, we're data driven. Um, but it gets to a point where if we're having questions about the integrity of the data, then we're having questions about the integrity of our decisions that we make based upon that data. And, I'm glad to hear that the superintendent is considering asking our internal auditor, and for those of you, again, who might be joining us late, our internal auditor really isn't internal to JCPS. It's an outside auditor that's... It's an external that's internal. Ex yeah, it's an external internal auditor, and it's a recommendation that was actually made by our former uh, state auditor, and uh, as a result of his audit of the district. So I just want to kind of put this in, in the framework that, you know, it isn't just internal to JCPS but that you're gonna look at the processes to find out if there are any other data issues and data reporting issues out here. And I think that's hugely important. And, re and I know this will tie into our strategy, at least you know, the way I can see it is tying into strategy 3.3.1 and possibly 3.3.3 .3, where we're talking about optimizing technology usage and also creating a technology roadmap. Um, so this is part of that strategy and part of uh, that process that relates to our vision state or to our uh, vision 2020 plan. So I'd want to try and get on our calendar a time when we can uh, have the superintendent report back. You know, uh, I know you mentioned it earlier, but I want to at least officially get it on the calendar where we're considering having our internal auditor report back to the uh, to the board and really try and put an end uh, to these these kind of ongoing data issues. This isn't just related to the, you know, just to the uh, seclusion and restraint reports or to the bus reporting that was kind of, you know, all within a week of each other, but it's also some other data issues that I think the board has kind of seen over the last year or two. And um, I just really want to try and put in an official request that yeah. we get that um, addressed. Yeah, if I can just, I mean, I, I think um, I had the, opportunity to attend the other working groups, um, both, um, you know, the, um, the one that Chris and Steph were leading um, and the one uh, that Lisa and Linda were doing. And this issue of the um, lack of a um, long-term technology roadmap um, to include not only the tools but also the processes around, you know, really being a big organization with coherent 
customer information, coherent um, processes. That came up a lot in the consultations that uh, you guys did, and um, I think it is reflected in the kind of difficulties that we're having. So, Lisa, sorry, can I kick it to you? No, that's Can't okay. Quit. Now, I have an item that's related to the data yeah, question, please. and it's, it's, specific, it's a specific example. <clears throat> but when we had the Success Pathways um, update, and we had data presented to us in aggregate form, that um, made it really difficult to discern what was going on school by school. And I think at the time, um, members of this board, maybe all the members of this board, expressed some dissatisfaction, not with the way the data was collected, but the way it was presented to us. So I think that's a huge part of the issue. If, if as a board we're going to have a clear understanding of the data, we need to have it presented to us in a way that really yields the most information so that we can make reasonable decisions. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to echo that and also remind everybody on the board, I mean, we all know, but one of the pieces of these process changes that we made and voted on, remember, was a um, kind of a set of standards for the reporting that would come to the board that, you know, we outlined, we tried to keep it at a pretty high level, but um, my perception is that in the work sessions that we've been having, I mean, the last, certainly the last, you know, four or five of them, um, have just rocked the quality of the reporting, the quality of the discussion that they've generated. Um, I think certainly in me the provocation to think a little bit more um, deeply have been good. So let's continue that. But you know we do have to you know we do have to keep improving how the information is presented so we get what we need to make decisions. Others, yes, Chuck. This uh, probably is more of a request of uh, board leadership, um, chair and vice chair. Um, it's become apparent to me that a lot of times when we're in work sessions that uh, we have uh, a lot of conversational dialogue that's very productive, it's very helpful, and we don't always have that kind of arena of talk here in this structure of this board meeting. Um, but I would like for uh, you to get with the superintendent and um, look at a time that maybe we can have some uh, short, brief Q&A or um, some conversational around the superintendent's report because there's a lot of good nuggets yep. that she presents every meeting and um, I think there would be a benefit for us to uh, you know, have some dialogue right after that. So sort so of a, a Q&A or discussion based on the, right after the superintendent's report. Yeah, make it part of that okay. element. Yes. Interesting. Thank you. That's a, that's a good suggestion. Other thoughts, Steph? I think when we talked about that last time, um, just because we like the, the, um, the dialogue, remember we talked about potentially, though, wanting to structure it within the strategic planning um, framework mm -hmm. um, so that if <coughs> If it's going to be um, that 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 it'd be better to provide a framework so it's not just the issues of the day, you That's know exactly. Yeah. So um, I would suggest you know if we've got the three you know the deeper learning you know the one two and three that somehow we structure an agenda item specifically whether I don't know that you know like I have to react to what Donna says in her you know. You report because you do have to give a report but we could maybe have on our agenda some kind of strategic planning and those would be the three so things could be discussed within that framework because we want to stay on a you know strategy level can I try to um, attach that to a point that I don't remember who made it before but just a request for um, you know an overall like a grid and a timeline um, of what's happening with the whole strategic plan so that we can get it. Um, so I think that is in the works, but we do need a, an understandable reporting tool. I think in the mayor's, um, if I can just refer to that, the, you know, the way the mayor talked about the cradle to career strategy, that was probably kind of an exemplar of what, if I understand you right, what you're saying there. In his case, I think there were five points and let's just, you know, I mean, we've got three, but let's start to structure our talk around banging them out. What are we doing? Yeah, on them. We want to hear, I mean, we want to hear, don't we all, you know, on yeah. deeper learning and, 
and whether it has to do with because um, everything can kind of fit within that, you know, whether we're talking about like the deliverables uh, from the Magnet School Review, it can kind of fit within, where does this all fit? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if it's operational and it deals with, you know, one of number three tenants, we still want to hear about it, and like, you know, pretty much every time there may be some item that we can get something, and, and there might be some decision that we, they will, that, that the group wants to give feed, you know, us to give some feedback on if it's some kind of strategy issue, okay. not That's operational. Great. Good. Other thoughts? Yep. Yes, Lisa. Um, so this has to, and I, I didn't do my homework. I don't have the strategy numbers in front of me. Uh, but uh, thank you. Uh, uh, one of our big emphases is improving school climate and culture. Right. Huge area of focus and. We've got right now the Code of Conduct Committee that has um, convened to review and revise our current po behavior policy. As that's happened, we've had a bunch of new data emerge that make it really clear that as a district, we really struggle, struggle with this issue, that uh, the number of seclusion and restraints, the number of bus referrals, um, that we're not really doing a great job. And so I think that policy piece is so important um, and I remember when Dr. Marshall and Jackie Wisman presented it to us last year they acknowledged that um, what was needed was more than a tweak right that it was a really going to be a substantial revision that was needed to get the policy to a place where we can really address behavior change and behavior improvement in a serious way so since the committee is their meetings are ongoing I'm just hoping that we can get from them on, a, on the planning calendar well before our June 14th when we're asked to approve it, that we can have them come and report to us and make sure that it's clearly in line with the strategic plan, that it's in line with best practices, our organizational values and all of that. I think, um, I think that's absolutely a good call out. Um, I am I, I actually, t you tell me if I'm wrong, but I think there are, there may be two elements to it. I mean, one is, you know, we've talked about the importance of um, <laughs> getting data in which we have confidence, mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a non-data yes. element, um, and I, I mean, I think, I feel like the board has to just put it back to you, Dr. Hargens. How do we, you know, how can we get um, a sense of um, you know, the culture um, and the confidence level in the schools um, that is beyond the anecdotal information that we all get, which by its nature comes from people who are, um, you know, who are troubled by something. Um, people are more likely to reach out when something's going wrong than when everything is smooth and normal. Um, but we don't have to wait three years to, you know, find it in you know, in numbers. Um, and I think that is a, again, with a huge organization, that is a really big challenge um, for us. But I think both of those pieces of climate and culture um, are important. Chris pointed out that's 2.1.3, so thank you. That's good. <laughs> Chris is moving to encapsulate the dialogue around that, good. which is great. Good. Um, so I've got a couple of um, ideas that um, Chris, uh, just like Chris, these are not my ideas. They came from um, discussions with um, with you guys or um, from outsiders, but I just want to throw them out. Um, <clears throat> one thing that comes up frequently in my individual discussion with you is we feel, um, I think each of us frustrated that we don't have enough time to just talk or that we're always sort of jammed and rushed in these public meetings. And I wonder if we ought maybe once a month to have um, even if it's just 15 or 30 minutes of work session time, um, and maybe we can just jam it into, you know, sort of the dinner hour, um, but take it as an intentional talk around, you know, are there things that are on our minds? Because it's not always something that we want to say that relates to something that's on the particular agenda. It may be longer term. Um, some of it comes up in these really good discussions that we're having, but some of it doesn't. So if that, um, and I'm, I apologize, I can't remember who suggested that, but that seemed like a good idea. 
Um, the other is, and we're going to go into board reports in a minute, but um, the reporting that we do about the time we spend in um, the schools and at community events and stuff, um, a number of people have suggested, can't you make that more interesting? Um, you know, we have this great um, video production capability um, right next door. We have in a number of our schools, I mean, you know, we saw two weeks ago, right, the manual um, presentation, I'm black but I'm not. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was fantastically created, I mean, creative and produced and thoughtful. Um, and it's not just the high schools. Um, but would there be a way to take some of that reporting and put it, um, you know, and maybe it's just we stop off and we make a two minute or two minute and 30 seconds, whatever, whatever YouTube says is the best length for actually getting watched, um, and then get it up on the website, but put it into a more interesting um, design. I've um, whispered to uh, board member Hathaway that his experience on the radio might be useful. <laughs> Maybe he would like to interview one or two of us as a way to make it more interesting. But we do, you know, we do get out, we see all kinds of interesting stuff in the schools, and um, I don't know, is there any interest in exploring that? Would that be fun? Sure. Okay. All right. We will test, uh, test that. Okay. I, I do have one, yeah, more, please. one more thing, and this ha just has to do with our board organization that yep. we took up at the beginning of the calendar year. <clears throat> and this was particularly with regard to advisory committees. Yes. We actually took a board member off of a number of committees and, and identified specifically some groups um, that are advisory to the board. And actually, Dr. Hargens and I had a chance to chat about this. Um, but. I think the board needs to know like specifically what are those advisory committees and how can we access their recommendations so that they're not reliant on some narrow chain of command for it to come to us and Dr. Hargens actually suggested maybe there would be a way for the advisory committee recommendations to be accessible online and we could look at them anytime and see what those committees are saying. So I just want to toss that okay. out there. So why don't we take it as an item um, possibly for a written report, but first order is an inventory of the advisory committees yes. and how they report and where that might be. Okay, great. Um, anything else? If not, I'll take a motion to approve the uh, planning calendar. Okay, Chuck moves, Steph seconds, all in favor? Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Good discussion. Uh, we are next on to board reports. So uh, who would like to begin? Chuck. Um, I wasn't able to prepare a YouTube video in time for this, <laughs> but. Uh, Feel free to beatbox and wrap that. If okay. you can. <laughs> <laughs> Only if I can get the superintendent to dance along to the video. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I, I did, uh, did want to uh, share with you some of the things that are going on in District 4. I'm not going to take a lot of time to voice them, uh, but I uh, did type them up. And to keep them interesting, Chair Jones, I probably should have used a better font to it. But uh, uh, I did want to highlight a couple. And, and I will, once, I, once we conclude here, I will give this to Angie, and she'll be able to post it. And, um, the media will be able to see it as well. Um, it's just a couple things I do want to highlight. I want to say congratulations. I'm, you know, I, I do a lot in the sports realm, so I'm, I'm a little drawn to that some. So I want to say congratulations to the Doss High School boys basketball team and their cheerleading team. They won the sixth region championship last night. It's the second time in a row for uh, the Doss uh, team and Coach Tony Williams. I also want to say congratulations to the Butler traditional girls basketball team that will be representing JCPS for the sixth region as well. So, and then um, there are some uh, really cool activities going on later in April where uh, some of the schools, we have 20 teams. I don't know if you all saw this in the Monday memo, but uh, there's 20 uh, schools that are going to the school technology leadership program state competition in Lexington. And I talked to a few of those schools there in District 4 that are showing, uh, are going there, so I, I shared a little bit about that. Also, just uh, because board members never have enough to read, um, <laughs> I do want to share, and I'll give this to Angie as well, I want to give uh, hats off to uh, um, 
Jonathan uh, Lowe for uh, keeping uh, me informed about what is going on with uh, the legislature in, in relation to education um, issues and also uh, the KSBA and uh, Debbie Westland and I get a lot of information. Uh, I may be a little geeky and, and following some of these things and I have been guilty of watching some streams of the, uh, the Senate Education Committee and the House Education Committee, but it is interesting to see our government at work. Um, this right here is a summary of, of leg there is a lot of uh, legislation that is going on um, uh, around education. Um, the, the McCarthy uh, strategic solutions that uh, sent this to Jonathan, he passed in my way, was originally a 14 page document. What I have whittled it down to so that you all be informed and you have a little homework is to see what uh, legislation has changed status since we last met. So I will, uh, with your feedback that you give me privately, uh, if this is something that is useful to you, um, I will continue to give this to you every time we meet. So that's my report. Okay, thank you. Who would like to go next? I will. Okay, Chris. Sorry, well, now I will not be singing or rapping this, and have no pass. I have no handouts. Um, I just want to report out uh, a, a couple things. First of all, uh, this um, since last we met, the um, board had a chance to attend the Kentucky State or Kentucky School Board Association. Uh, school boards association. Sorry, I didn't want me to get that right. Uh, meeting at that their annual conference was in Louisville, and uh, we had a you know really great, interesting uh, you know events that we were able to, or sessions we were able to attend and get some of our mandatory training knocked out of the way. But uh, we also saw some um, you know some really good presentations on that. But I think the best part, at least for me, and I suspect for the rest of the board is that we had several students from some of our high schools out there as part of what we what they called the app team. Uh, KSBA for the first time really had a, a mobile app for this conference that they were utilizing. And the um, as a resource, on-site resource if not help desk, uh, JCPS was able to have a lot of our technology students, I believe from DOS and Eastern and uh, I'm missing one more. I want to say Wagner maybe. Um, I apologize. Oh, more, more. Uh, I apologize if I missed anyone. But I know that those three schools provided students uh, for the um, for the conference, and they were there. Uh, they were out there, uh, you know, helping our school board members from across the state download the application and doing actually quite a bit more. Uh, reconfiguring iPads, uh, you know, configuring email accounts, uh, so things of that nature. So they are there as a resource and they were fantastic. I uh, got a lot of compliments from other school board members and they are very appreciative of our students and just shows you, uh, you know, what folks are doing out there. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it was just fantastic. So I really appreciate all that. Uh, Ryan Deal also uh, was out there for both days uh, coordinating that effort. He's one of our um, um, central office staff. So just want to say thank you to him as well. Um, as, um, so in addition to that, uh, I also want to kind of call out, um, first of all, I want to say congratulations to Daryl Farmer. He was a former uh, vice principal for uh, DuPont Manual High School who is now brand new principal at Ramsey Middle School. And we're uh, just, I had a chance to interrupt the meeting the other day, and Michelle, if you're in here, I do apologize for that. Um, but uh, apparently his, uh, I think it's a thing that we have, that he likes Reese's peanut butter cups, so we'll give him some of those um, and welcome him to uh, District 7. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, speaking with him and talking to him in the future. So we're really glad, uh, glad that he's on board now. Um, and lastly, I want to uh, say again, congratulations to everyone who uh, went out to the uh, JCPS Idea Festival, to all the students that, were, that attended it and all the students that presented at it. They were fantastic uh, sessions. I only caught a little bit of it, but I did catch the closing um, talk and the closing presentation. And I'm apologize if I'm mispronouncing his name, but Munker, who is a junior at DuPont Manual High School, gave a presentation about his Amplify Life device, which is basically a $70 hearing aid. Uh, any of you all who know about hearing aids knows that those things are about 15, 13 to 1500 dollars. Uh, he was able to create one for 15 dollars, or actually, I'm sorry, uh, 70 dollars. Um, it's a little bulky, but it does a great job. And while he was talking, I kept looking around for the TED sign. 
because it seemed like he was a te it was a TED talk. He was completely polished. I talked to his principal earlier. He said he was a nervous wreck. It didn't show. It didn't show at all. Um, so he did a fantastic presentation, and it just I was just really really blown away by that. And I just wanted to call that out. And everyone else who uh, who presented at the JCPS Idea Festival is a great event. So. Okay, great. Thanks, Linda. Did I see your hand up? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, <clears throat> achievement I just, unlocked. <laughs> I just uh, want to set a precedent there, and uh, <laughs> no, I had I've had uh, several. I had a very busy uh, past couple of weeks. Actually, simple. Uh, I'll just try and hit the highlights on this uh, simple elementary. Uh, held their Black uh, History Wax Museum, and some of those students were selected, I think, and, and combined with another school to do uh, to do that a little later. But it was it's always an amazing event. Those kids sing their lines, or they read their scripts, or they uh, just have them memorized. But they're um, they're amazing in how they look like their characters, dress up like their characters, and and do such a wonderful job explaining things. I went to uh, Fairdale Elementary while I watched the education majors from Fairdale High School work with the elementary kids and the teachers there uh, during the hour that they go over and intern with them. And um, that's, you know, I just want to know how many we can hold on to because those, those kids are really into helping uh, the elementary kids and the teachers and, and really contributing more hands on deck in those buildings or in that building particularly. Um, I attended a meeting at Fairdale, but after the meeting, um, I went over to the fine arts room where we had an African dance troupe perform, and uh, I had invited the ESL students in to watch the uh, African dance troupe. I'm, I, I wish the whole school could have seen it. It was uh, fun and uh, just kind of uh, engulfing. I mean, it took us all in. And, and, uh, some of us joined in the dancing. I headed out toward the hallway, so I could not uh, be a part of that. But it was, it was very good. Although I did have a drum beat down, I think I could have done that. Too. Um, also attended KSBA's uh, conference, uh, two-day conference, that Mr. Brady has talked about. Shadowed a student at Shawnee High School for uh, uh, from 9:30 until 1:30, and felt so out of place there because I didn't know how to explain who I was and these kids kept looking at this strange old woman <laughs> following another child around, you know. But uh, my host was Milan, or Milan, and uh, she is a future Navy pilot and she was uh, quite a great host hostess for me and what, always made sure I had a seat in class before she left me to go out in the hallway and visit with her friends. But uh, she always took, she took care of me very well during the day. And um, you know, school is just still school. Uh, I very much enjoyed the, the day with them. Seemed like lunch was a little bit longer than what I used to have, uh, but it may just have been that time went slow, more slowly because I didn't eat. So it may have been, may have been that. Uh, and finally, I attended a junior achievement session. Uh, I'd never been to Finance Park before, and so my grandson's uh, class, seventh grade class from Farnsley, was going to go there for the day and do their work. And so I said, oh, this is a great time for me to go and watch. And um, it was just wonderful. The kids were uh, amazing in knowing what they were supposed to do and jumping in on the work. and. Um, I just very much enjoyed that and appreciate so much what Junior Achievement does for us. Thank you. I don't know if anybody's going to want to try to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Steph said she would. <laughs> okay, Steph. <laughs> um, I have had a few school visits that were just wonderful. Um, I went to Low Elementary. They had um, a celebrity reader event, and I read in Miss Green's class a book that I really like. It's called I Like Me, and uh, that was just a wonderful experience. Um, it was also wonderful to see Dustin Johnstone. He is the assistant principal at Lowe, and he'd been in a major accident, and he's made a full 100% recovery, and so it was a delight to see Dustin. 
Um, and also today was a shadow at, with Daniela, and she is a student at the um, Newcomer Academy at the Phoenix School, um, at the old Myers School. And I think that half the kids in the room were bigger than me, um, but they were, it was delightful. Um, they were children from all over the world, and they are teaching tolerance and among English and math and science and you know social studies. So it was it was um, delightful. I also rode a bus. Um, I evidently I did not ride the bus home. So I was told that riding the bus home is the real challenge because on the bus there they were all asleep, basically. <laughs> Um, but my bus drivers were just bright, like very, you know, spunky in the morning. Dan and Travis were just awesome bus drivers. So I just wanted to thank them um, for that. So um, I think that's all my report. Thank you. Okay. Diane. I would like to say that um, a few years ago, board member Duncan and I went to San Diego and board member Duncan was a part of the drum circle, <laughs> so she knows where she, what she's doing and where wow. she's coming from. So, you know, cut her a little bit of slack. She knows what she's doing. Uh, quickly, I'd just like to uh, thank Junior Achievement. I had an opportunity to attend their uh, banquet this year, and it was exceptional in that they recognize adults, but the students always introduce the adults, so they did a wonderful job with that. Uh, Dr. Harkins and I were at the Central High School Dist Distinguished Alumni, and this year they uh, identified five. Dr. Frederick Fresh, Yvette Gentry, who we've heard her name earlier, Alice King Houston, Kennedy, Kenneth Kennedy, and Jason Williams. Jason Williams, I'm happy to say, is a graduate of the Law and Government class at Central High School and is now an attorney. Uh, the Idea Festival, um, with the students was phenomenal. The morning session was phenomenal. There were two presentations that I just want to call the names of them because the students were outstanding. Making the Dream Possible, Higher Education for Undocumented Students. And it was an exceptional presentation. And the next uh, discussion we heard was Accepting Diversity. It was a panel discussion from students and it was outstanding as well. On uh, March the 1st, uh, Mayor Fisher had a youth forum at the Western Library, and I had an opportunity to go and listen, and it was a diverse group of students from all over Jefferson County representing many schools, and very honest conversation about what's, how students feel, and if they continue to do that, I would encourage us as board members to go and listen to the things that they talk about for example, um, a student was there and she said, I'm Muslim, I'm proud to be Muslim, but no one knows what that means. So rather than accept me, you tease me and you bully me. So that tells me that we have work to do as a community, not just as JCPS, but as a community. It was very um, informative and I'm glad I had the opportunity to be there. Also, uh, Leadership Louisville had their summit and I am happy to report that Dr. John Marshall did a presentation, and of course the presentation had to be, it's right there, the elephant in the room. So he did an outstanding presentation and it was good to be there. So um, that completes uh, my thoughts. And uh, Linda, would you draw me out, please? <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I am learning. I, I mean, those who are at dinner know that it has been a surprising evening. So, and, all right, Lisa. <laughs> no surprises here. Um, I, Shadow a Student was really a great experience. I got to spend a day at Seneca High School uh, with my host, Erica who is a future psychologist, so we had a lot to talk about, which was very nice. Uh, and uh, Principal Harbolt and uh, Erica's classmates were very welcoming, and it was, as Ms. Duncan said, just great to be back in school for a full day. It was really nice. Um, Dr. Hargens referred to the archery tournament at Moore Traditional, uh, and I just want to say a little bit more about that. Uh, Moore was the first school, public or private, in Louisville to offer archery. 
um, and they are the first registered scholastic 3D archery program, which qualifies students to compete in archery at the college level. So that's right here in JCPS. Um, it's the only school in Louisville teaching archery at that level. As Dr. Hargens mentioned, uh, their tournament last week, they had over a thousand kids participating from um, almost 50 different schools. So a special shout out to Moore High School teacher Kyle McCune, who started not only that archery program, but programs all around the city. Um, and I, I really just want to thank all of our teachers who go beyond the classroom to share their individual passions with our students. It opens up worlds and horizons to them. And uh, Kyle McCune <coughs> was just a great example of that. So thanks to him and the others like him. Um, I also attended the KSBA conference. Uh, particularly meaningful and useful to me, I think, was Dr. Thomas Alsbury's presentation. Um, where we've, as, as we've discussed, we're sort of undergoing a, an evaluation right now by Dr. Alsbury. It was really helpful for me to hear him talk so specifically about the power and importance of democratically elected school boards and that the governance, the quality of the governance and our focusing on results for students really makes a difference. So it was useful to hear that from him again. Um, grateful to this board for our focus on continuous improvement for the sake of our students. So I, I just um, appreciate that. Um, tomorrow, uh, I'm going with Dr. Hargens and several other people from the district on a field trip to the Hamilton City Schools District in Ohio. Um, so in a two-year period, Hamilton City Schools has made substantial gains, not only in reducing suspensions and behavioral referrals, but actually in improving <coughs> behaviors. Um, so we're going to get to see that in practice um, tomorrow. They've implemented not only school-wide, but district-wide restorative practices. And I know a bunch of us are eager to see what that looks like uh, in person. Um, and they have seen, as I say, a shift, a substantial shift in their um, data in the past two years. And then the final thing that I'll mention that's also been referred to tonight, uh, the Bellarmine Literacy Project. We had that fantastic presentation the last time. We were very short on time, and we missed the opportunity for a Q&A session. So I uh, ran up to Dr. Cooter and some of the other folks from Bellarmine and got my really quick individual Q&A session. And it was really interesting. They were able to outline three very, very specific criteria that set the conditions for the Bellarmine Literacy Project to be so successful. So it's really, I thought, important to hear that it's not, it's a wonderful program, but it's not a magic bullet, um, and that we as a board still have a responsibility, whatever programs we implement, that we're making sure that right. we're setting up the conditions that make success possible. Um, so that's it for me. OK, thank you. Um, I will be quick. Um, I was also at the KSB presentation by Dr. Alsbury, as was Dr. Hargens with, uh, with Lisa. And um, just as the first time uh, when Linda and I heard him, it was, it was really good, covered really different material this time. It was, um, so I think we've got a lot of opportunity to continue that relationship and learn um, as a board. Um, I will not repeat the same exact shout out for the Idea Festival, but one of the things I would observe of that is I think there were 14 schools represented this year. Recall that it started five years ago as the manual Idea Festival, but it's now broadened out and I think approximately 40 students from each school and um, the level of um, civility um, intensity and um, you know just uh, dialogue um, from the students was remarkably um, impressive and I, I guess I would just repeat something that Dr. Hargan says often you know there are tremendous students in each of our schools and there are needy students in each of our schools and struggling kids um, you know I think this was a self-selected group from each school that chose to come but um, we should all feel really good about that. Um, just uh, one other quick thing. Um, the Speed Museum has now reopened, and um, I think, uh, well, I'm sorry, it opens up very soon. It had its opening party, but Sundays will be free. 
and I think that is a tremendous opportunity for our families and who knows what, but the, um, the facility is enormous. We now have a, you know, a great art museum here that our students will have the opportunity to see. So that's all I have. I think that uh, concludes our reports. And um, we are now ready to go to persons requesting to address the board on non-agenda items. There are three, the first of whom is Linda Schurer. Linda Schurer, you know the, you know the drill. You've been here before. You have three minutes with one bell after two and a half. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you. I'm here <coughs> once again to address my concerns about Southeast Christian Church Health Clinic opening at the Academy at Shawnee. I am glad it is finally scheduled to open next week as there is no doubt it will be welcomed. These are some of the neediest students in our system. They have complex physical, social, and emotional needs, including the need for thorough, accurate, and complete sex education. My concern after reading the statement of faith that all employees of the health clinic must sign is that proselytizing seems to be a part of their health commitment of their faith commitment, pardon me, while sex education is specifically excluded. While there was a conversation prior to the contract being signed that proselytizing would not take place, the contract spells out specifically that it replaces all verbal and or written agreements prior to the date the contract was signed. Therefore, I believe it would be prudent and respectfully request that such an agreement be put in writing before next Tuesday, the date of the grand opening, and that it be signed by both the board and the representative from the clinic that each student's culture and religion will be respected and no proselytizing will be done. If that is not possible, then I suggest that there may be other faiths that might like to place information in the clinic area and request that such a place be provided. Thank you for your consideration of these concerns and for the feedback I feel certain I will receive from Dr. Hargens, Assistant Superintendent Ms. Dennis, and Principal Benbo. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks. The next speaker is Keisha Cosby. Ms. Cosby, you'll have three minutes to speak um, with, I'm sorry, there you go, two people walking up. Um, three minutes to speak, there will be one bell after two and a half and two bells at the end of three minutes. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. Um, kind of nervous here, this is my first time. Uh, my issue is concerning Valley High School. Um, the first thing I will say is, I do think it's a bad idea to, uh, put the middle school in with the high school um, because uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, three uh, juniors, three 11th graders, um, jumped the eighth grader after school during uh, track practice. My daughter's on the track team. And um, they, uh, my daughter was part of the incident too. Um, one of the, um, her friends, they slam the child's uh, head into the glass that she uh, blacked out. And uh, my daughter was part of that to help her out as well as other eighth graders because there were three, um, three uh, juniors. Um, nobody, I guess, did anything about the first fight. It was three fights that day, that afternoon. The second fight, the junior left, came back, brought her mother into the school, and her, her mother and her boyfriend hit one of the other eighth graders again, uh, attacked her, and then there was another altercation again. And after that, you know, my daughter, as well as the other ones, they got suspended, you know, from school. 
And, you know, I didn't like that for the simple fact that they got attacked by juniors. And then um, just recently on Friday, the same two juniors attacked one of the girls again. And I had to take, this was during school. They did this during school when she was on her way to third period. And uh, now her mom doesn't want to send her back to school. And I had to take my daughter to school for protract practice because she was scared to go because she was scared that they were going to jump her. And my daughter's 13 years old. And I've talked to Mr. Stevenson. I've called to talk to the superintendent. Um, and I'm just worried they're getting Facebook messages, uh, threats, and I'm just worried um, you know, what's going to happen if somebody's going to do something before uh, a child gets killed at that school. Okay, thank you for sharing this with us tonight. Um, our uh, practice is the superintendent will take this board and she or somebody will get back to you with a response. Okay. Thank you for coming tonight. And the last speaker is Chris Kolb. Mr. Kolb, you've also been here before. Three minutes, one bell after two and a half. My name is Chris Kolb, as you know, and I'm a member of St. Francis of Assisi Catholic Church, a member of Congregation of Clout. Every year, Clout gathers together hundreds of families across the city to listen to personal stories about what deeply concerns the members and clergy of our congregations. So we've known for some time that many of our kids aren't treated fairly at school, as you just heard coincidentally, and some have been physically abused. Today, the Courier Journal reported that at least 4,400 children in JCPS were restrained or secluded last year. This confirms that our stories are not outliers, but part of a systemic threat to the health, safety, and the lives of our children. Here's what the research says. Seclusion and restraint often involve pinning a child face down on the floor, locking them in dark closets, and tying them up with straps, handcuffs, or duct tape. Seclusion and restraint pose significant physical danger to students, and at least 20 children have died as a result. Seclusion and restraint cause psychological trauma, including post-traumatic stress disorder. Here's what one parent said after finding out her child had been restrained and secluded. I remember just sitting on the bed and crying. If you did this at home, you'd be arrested. There's been a lot of laughter and jokes made here tonight, but there's nothing funny about systemat systematically damaging thousands of children, and we're disappointed that your attitude tonight has not reflected that. In today's Courier Journal, Superintendent Hargan says the use of restraint and seclusion is a way to protect the child. Can you explain to us how inflicting psychological trauma, causing physical injury, and putting a child's life in danger protects the child? Dr. Hargens also says that JCPS has known the numbers reported to the state are wildly inaccurate since last year, but only informed the state last week. In fact, JCPS confirmed the inaccurate numbers to the state even after knowing the numbers were wrong. In other words, the administration knowingly misled the Kentucky Department of Education. The administration wants us to believe there are so many extreme and violent uh, incidents uh, that necessitate seclusion and restraint 25 times every day in JCPS. This is simply not possible, according to well-accepted research. Indeed, this number of restraints and seclusions is only possible with a tacit or explicit approval from administration that restraint and seclusion are acceptable, acceptable responses to minor situations. For six years, we've told you that what is happening to our children is reprehensible and intolerable. Will you now finally believe our personal stories? One week from tonight, over 1,000 students, parents, and teachers will gather to address what can only be called this moral outrage. Given the deeply disturbing nature of today's report, we expect school board members and the superintendent will be present to publicly commit that violence against children will not be tolerated. As parents and taxpayers, you owe it to us to be there and answer to the community. You're having an executive session tonight. We suggest you discuss plans to attend. Thank you. Thank you for being with us tonight. And that concludes our speakers on non-agenda items. Um, we will now move into executive session. Excuse me one moment while I find the description here. Okay. We're going to conduct a closed session that is permitted by KRS 61.8101F. 
of the Open Meetings Act for the purpose of a discussion regarding the discipline of an individual student. Is there a motion? Linda moves, a second, Diane seconds, all in favor, unanimous. Uh, thank you, we will go into closed session and be back to adjourn. <coughs> Thank you.